Welcome back to the Habit Based Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Ewell, and today we're going to be talking about the habit of resilience. I have a very special guest on the show today. His name is Jim Stavis. He is a triple transplant survivor, author of When Hope is Your Only Option. He is also the CEO of Paragon Steel, which is a steel distributor in Southern California. Uh, I just want to welcome you and having you on the show today. Hi, Jesse. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great, man. So uh, I read up a little bit on your story. Um, one of the things that really struck me was that uh, 17 years old, you found out that you had uh, diabetes. Was this kind of the start of uh, this whole health process or was there things that happened earlier on in your life? No, that was really the beginning. I had had a pretty normal life up until that time when I was diagnosed with juvenile type 1 diabetes. And that was back in the 1970s when it wasn't as common as it is today. Right. And so, you know, back in 1970s, when you found this out, uh, you know, what, what was that like for you being 17 years old and like, you know, knowing what they have now? But back then, I'm guessing no one really knew that much about what to treat it with or how to do that. What was that like for you? It was, it was really pretty uh, shocking and um, discouraging, to be perfectly honest with you, because to be given a diagnosis, which at that time I had had a perfectly normal, healthy life, and then to be told that my life was going to contain things like kidney and heart disease, blindness, amputations, and, and a, a host of things. Plus, I'd have to take insulin shots, which for me at the time was a pretty major thing. And uh, my life really looked very different at that time than, let's say, what my friend's lives look, looked like. Sure. Yeah, I can't imagine at uh, 17 you know, hearing that not only in 2019, but this is, you know, 1970, uh, which was what, about 50 years ago? 50 years now, yes. Yeah, um, so I can't imagine, you know, what that was like back then. So as you found this out, what, what started to change in your life from that point forward? Well, what I realized is that I really had a choice and the, and the choice was how was I going to deal with this information and, and how was I going to, was it going to define my life and in terms of how I would deal with it, um, I could have just kind of dropped out and become frustrated and used it to in some ways just, you know, kind of roll up into a ball and, and try and, you know, shrivel up to nothing, or I could use it as a motivator to get my life together, realizing that my lifespan was going to be shorter than what I had thought it to be. And so that's what I did as I, I kind of used it to get my life in order sooner, went to college, started a business at a very young age, raised a family. And just, and my thought process was that hopefully medical technology would have an answer for me when those things started to happen, which is exactly what did occur. Okay. I, I never thought back in the early 1970s that uh, organ transplantation would have been um, a reality for me many, many years later, which ultimately it saved my life. Sure. So, um, so 1970, you kind of find this out, you start living your, your life and, you know, obviously you're probably having to take insulin and, and do all these testing. Where did you get to a point where you're like, this is really affecting my heart, my kidneys, my pancreas. Like how long was kind of that span from 1970 to where you're like, okay, like, uh, this is really starting to affect some areas on me. Well, I was told when I was given that initial diagnosis that I'd be lucky to live to the age of 50. Okay. And so in my 40s, I started having heart problems, started in my early 40s, and then 
in my later 40s, my kidneys started to break down and I went into congestive heart failure, which is really very uh, close to death. Okay. And I was on kidney, kidney dialysis for about a year. And then it was then that I went to Cedar sinai Hospital here in Southern California and the head of cardiology there is a gentleman or doctor named Pete K. Shaw. And Dr. Shaw told me that um, I was a candidate for a new heart and kidney transplant and best case pancreas too, because that was the source of the diabetes. The only problem is they had never done an organ transplant before and he wasn't sure if it had ever been done anywhere else. So it was a pretty pretty big moment for me and it really goes back to that first discussion I was telling you back when I was 17 is that I realized that this was kind of a you know a, a, a moment for me to decide what I was going to do and I basically jumped at the opportunity and and made that happen so that's this is now 14 years ago um, just recently had the 14 year anniversary of that transplant and uh, I'm proud to say that everything's going really well because I'm just about to my 65th birthday coming up in about a week from now. So, so you, you had this 14 years ago on, in yes. 2005 and you've, you know, now it's almost 15 years later and you're, uh, Doing great. you're in great health. Yes. In, and all, all the organs are working great. And a big part of my life and my mission now is, helping for the cause of organ donation, encouraging people to donate, as well as using a lot of the lessons that I learned along the way to help them with their own adversity. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the lessons. You know, obviously, um, this podcast is about the habit of resilience and finding this out at 17. um, You know, there's a couple things is like, man, you know, back in 1970, you know, I'm sure there wasn't a lot of people that knew what diabetes was or what it really meant. But just to hear that somebody's like, hey, you know, you're not going to live past 50 or, or whatever, I would have to think in the back of your mind, it's like you have to kind of believe the doctor at the time um, that that's true. And so your whole life, it's like your life's chasing you in a way. Um, but just the fact that you were resilient enough and, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Not only that, but you had a family, you had a business, you had all these other things going on. And in the back of your mind, there's this thought of, I may not live past 50. So what was that like from a a resilience standpoint? Well, it's, you know, the reality is we all have an expiration date. We just don't know when it is. And, right. and the, for, for me to be told at a very young age when that expiration date would be, in some ways, gave me a timeline with which to work with. So I was being told that I'd be lug, lucky to live past my 50th birthday. And as irony would be, I had those transplants as I was turning 50. So they certainly were telling me the truth and in, in, in the ideas that. I was going to be subjected to all of these, let's say, failures that my body would start to um, experience as a result of the diabetes. That was true as well. So I was certainly, it's not as if I didn't know going in what I was in for. Right. But, but I had a belief system, and a, I think a big part of that is the hope that I had that there would be a solution for me and that 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 solution ultimately, again, was transplant. But aside from that, I think you have to have kind of a, an inner resolve, an inner belief that you can endure just about anything. And so, oh, so where, did that, where did that inner belief come from and kind of that desire? It's a great question. I think that to some degree we are, you know, we have a lot of, uh, through our upbringing and, uh, and, the, and the, the experiences that we have through life teaches us a lot about how to get through hard times. But I also believe that, um, you know, you have 
faith, you have um, belief in, in family. Um, there's a lot of things that motivate you in, in, along the way. Um, when I was being prepared for transplant, they, they sent a social worker to me to discuss you know, whether or not I was up to the task of a transplant. And, and in their discussion with me, they said, what is your source of hope? And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. What is my source of hope? Because I think everybody needs to know what is it that drives you, that, that motivates you to get up and do what you do each and every day. And for me, it was, it was actually two things. One is it, I had a level of optimism that things were going to work out. And, and so if things were meant to happen, then I would live. And if they weren't meant to happen, then I would die. And so um, in some ways, I had kind of a fatalistic view of life that, you know, sure. there are certain things we can control and there are certain things that we can't. So, so between the optimism and the fatalis fatalistic view, that, those were the drivers to be my source of hope. Okay. But that was for me, and, you know, I realize that everybody's different. And some people, you know, they might they might lean more on their their faith, or their belief in God. Others might have a a belief in family, or you know, it, for everybody that source of hope is different. And I think it's a great question to ask yourself: is what is it that drives you, and not to necessarily be on your deathbed when you're asking that question. Yeah, I mean, how many uh, how many kids do you have? I have three. Three kids. You have three kids at 50 years old. How old are your kids? Today, I've got one that's 35, one that's 32, and one that's 29. Okay, so, th you know, back then, they're anywhere from 15 to right. 20 years old, which, right. you know, it's like your kids are, uh, it sounds like a lot of them, I mean, they were old enough to obviously know what was going on, not only that, um, to know that, hey, here's, here's my legacy uh, with my kids. Um, you know, they're at an age where they're starting to enter into young adults, uh, yes. you know, and so they, they understood and knew what was going on. But I think uh, one of the powerful things you said is, you know, my family, um, because I think a lot of times we have a tendency to be like, oh, man, like all this stuff's happening to me. I think when you have family, you tend to focus on your family as your driver uh, versus, you know, Hey, there's something that, that may be wrong with me or going on with me. And you, and like you said, uh, you have this business also. So it's kind of like this entire focus of, Hey, I have all these other things. Like I can't, I have a lot of responsibilities. I can't, you know, go now. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think, you know, really resilience is, uh, you know, can you in hard times uh, or difficult situations, can, do you have the resilience to actually get through that? And I think leveraging, you know, your family, your faith, uh, you know, your kids and just, you know, having a greater purpose beyond just kind of living is, is a super powerful way to kind of look at this and look at life. So I agree. I agree. Um, I agree. A great story that when, when, when this was all going on, my son was in um, Colorado. He went to school at, at Boulder in Colorado. And I was there and we were having one of these father-son moments. And he says to me, you know, you and I, dad, are very similar. And I said, oh, how, what, why do you say that? And he says, well, you know, um, we both have had to go through a lot of adversity in our life. And I thought, well, I know what my adversity was, is what, what is yours being a 19 year old college student? And he says, well, you know, when you were going through all of your health adversity, it was really hard for me not knowing if my dad was going to survive and whether or not I was going to be going through life without a father. And it just kind of hit me on the head. Like I'm so busy looking at it through my own eyes, not realizing how that's impacting, let's say, my my family's eyes, realizing right. that, that they could have lost me. Right. So that was a telling moment for me to realize that it's not all about me. 
Yeah, and that's amazing that, you know, your son was able to share that with you. Uh, yeah. Because I think a lot of times, you know, kids, they tend to hold that stuff in, which I'm sure at 17, uh, you know, it's like, who do I talk to about what's going right. on? Uh, and we tend to kind of internalize that stuff. Very true. So, um, so how long you're, are you married? Yeah, I married, uh, my wife and I have been together for 37 years now. So what, what is, uh, you know, what's been the, what's this been like for you and your wife over like 37 years? Cause you know, she obviously like married into this and she's been with you. It sounds like pretty much the whole way. She has, and it's been a, you know, I, I give her a lot of credit for helping me through the journey because I think that having a strong support system is a critical part of what's necessary to get through it. I mean, interestingly, you know, not to, to dwell on another subject, but my wife just was recently diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer, which oh, we're wow. in the middle of right now. And so suddenly I am now the caregiver and she's the, the center of attention, which, you know, but, but because we've been through so much together, you know, we kind of roll up our sleeves and just, you know, kind of like, okay, we're going to get through this just like we got through the last adversity. And my kids have, are kind of falling in line like they did with me. They're now falling in line for her. So it's, it's, it's interesting what life can throw at us unexpectedly and that's a big part of my message is that the one thing that we know is that tomorrow is you know not predicted or you know there, there's no uh there's no shortage of change in, our, in everyone's life so yeah I'm just there i think uh i mean I, I think that's super powerful and super important that like you know you've you really leveraged this to bring your family together instead of, you know, it would be really easy for everybody to kind of run in their own way and, and just kind of think about themselves in this place. Yeah. Um, so you wrote a book, uh, I'm sure after, how, when did you write your book? Um, it came out last year. So, okay. so what, what part of my business is I write a uh, newsletter and in that newsletter, I started to chronicle some of the stories of my uh, story. And I found that I had, like, it resonated with a lot of people. And um, so I decided that I would take that and kind of expand on it and, and write a book, which the idea is not just to write about my story, but it's to be able to kind of write a a how to get through tough times and using my story as the backdrop for that. And so um, it's been very well received for people going through any type of adversity, not just health, but personal business, you know, it could be uh, just about anything because the, the messaging is pretty universal. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, from a, a health standpoint is our health really can affect everything in our life because, you know, it could affect our business. It could affect our family, uh, which you can't always say with everything else. But I, I think that health is kind of your first place. You always start. If there's something going on there, it's very hard to do a lot of your other things very true. To show up in business and in life. Um, so, you know, how can people find out about this book? Uh, where can they find it? So again, the name of the book is When Hope is Your Only Option. It's available through booksellers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble. There's an audible version in my voice, okay. which, um, which I recorded as well. And um, I have a Facebook page, Jim Stavis Speaks, which shows where I'm speaking at and posting blogs, et cetera. And then there's also a website, which is jimstavis.com, which you can go to. And I did a, um, a documentary on my story and also the story of the donor boy who died and whose organs I've got. Um, he was a, 
a football player up in the Santa Barbara area. And um, I've gotten to know his family pretty well. And, uh, you know, I, I chronicled his story as well because, you know, I'm the survivor, but he was unfortunately tragically lost in this whole this whole story. So Yeah, so let's talk about this for a second is, um, you know, you find out you have to have a heart. Daddy, hey. you, uh, but Daddy, can you do my show up? No, not right now. I'm on a call. Thank you. Uh, that's my little daughter. I like that. <laughs> so uh, you find out that you have to have a heart, um, kidney, and pancreas, right? Yeah. Transplant. Yeah. Uh, and you know, to find a donor for one is probably pretty difficult, but to find a donor for all three is probably extremely rare. And I think the other thing that you said is this hospital had never done three, uh, at one time, correct? That's correct. And so you ended up having this 17 year old boy, uh, who played football. Um, he, he got into an auto accident. That's correct. And he was an organ donor or his parents, um, you know, said it was okay to be an organ donor. I think at 17, do you get to choose? So, so the way it works is that um, particularly when you're, when you go to the DMV for your license, they'll ask you a question, which is, do you want, would you be willing to be an organ donor? And for many, they, it's the first time they've ever been asked that question. So. Right. In this particular instance, this boy's brother had a friend that had passed away and was an organ donor. And so my donors had said, God, that would be kind of cool. I mean, you can't take your organs with you. At least you could save other people's lives. So he made the conscious effort to say yes to organ donation. And then ultimately when he passed, Unfortunately, um, he was he had consented for his organs to be donated, and okay. and so I was the beneficiary the beneficiary of that. Um, I had tip, typically in this in this world, this organ donation world, um, donors and recipients don't meet one another. In my instance, I was. Um, given an opportunity to meet with them and have had a continuing relation with them so that uh, we, we, I was riding on the Rose Parade float a couple years ago holding his, his um, picture and um, the family was in the stands with my family and it was kind of a cool thing. So we've, we've had an ongoing relationship with this family. Uh, we get together a couple times a year they listen to my to their son's heart beating in my chest when we get together so it's a, it's it's a pretty special thing really yeah that's amazing uh so if you guys are listening to this um you know i'm probably not here interviewing jim if you know this 17 year old boy doesn't donate his organs um so if you're listening to this like just think about the impact um that this is because like this guy's living proof that, you know, people can save people's lives. Uh, and again, they, we can't take our organs with us uh, when we die. So I, I would really challenge you to think about this uh, is how you could impact somebody else's life and actually save their life by you, you know, doing this and knowing that a 17 year old boy actually like thought about that. Um, and truly had an impact on your life and just the amazing story you have with the family. Um, so yeah, I just, I think that's really amazing. Well, thank you, Jesse. I, I, I appreciate the plug because organ donation really does save lives. In fact, you save um, eight lives or saved organs alone every um, death and um it's and if you, there's there's two ways to one the dmv and the other is just they have a registry on donate life california.org that you can go on and actually register online 
it's uh, it really does. I, I'm I'm living living proof that organ donation saves lives. Let's get into a lesson somebody could take away from you and just kind of what you've been through. A life lesson. Okay. I would say that a life lesson that's been probably most important to me is just to never give up hope. I mean, hope to me, I, I view it as it's something that has kind of been my um, mantra, if you will. I view hope as an action verb. It's not something that you just sit on the, co- the couch and think about what you're wishing for, but it's, it's kind of a call to action and, and what that action could be is um, researching whatever it is that's besetting you. Uh, it could be uh, mentoring somebody through, uh, their, you know, through something that they're going through. It could be praying, meditating, doing something that puts you on the right path, knowing that you're going to get from here to there. Okay, so you know, to you, hope is putting yourself in action of actually like taking a step forward, even if it's a small step in doing one thing, like praying, meditation, studying right. about maybe what's going on in your life, mentoring. Right. So it sounds like these are all things that you did um, instead of staying stuck in right. one place of man, like uh, there's just no way for me to, to cure this. And I, and I think, People overlook this as they want to know, like, hey, what's the secret to hope or what's the secret to resilience? And what I'm hearing you say is it's just taking this one step forward uh, every single day. Yes, I, I actually broke it out into three stages. One, the first stage to me is you have to endure. You've got to get through the whatever it is that's setting you back, be it pain, sorrow, loss, whatever that might be, you've got to somehow just get through it. Or as Nike says, just do it. Okay. Um, the, se- the second stage is hope, which is what I just was talking about, which is putting yourself in the right frame of mind, um, which can affect your belief system, your attitude, your behavior. And then the third stage, which is the stage that I would say I'm in now, which is the prevail stage which is after you've gotten through the adversity and you've climbed the mountain now what now how are you going to use that uh, lessons that you've learned to help others get through their adversity and that's to me perhaps the most fulfilling of the three stages is because you're kind of giving back to the process sure and uh you know, they, I think they talk a lot about this is, uh, you know, when you can really leverage the lessons you've learned. So other people may not have to go through the same pain or same loss that you have. Right. Um, And it just, you know, uh, somebody said a long time ago, um, in a program I was in is pain shared is pain divided. Happiness shared is happiness multiplied. Uh, and I think, you know, you're giving people hope by sharing your pain. Um, And so by you sharing your pain and what you've been through, you're also sharing your happiness at the same time that you're actually giving people hope by just simply sharing your story. Very true. I like that. Yeah. So uh, is there any last words you, you want to leave for someone? Well, we've covered, we've covered, I, I essentially have three points, two of which we've covered, which is, um, the hope message, which we just talked about, and the other was um, organ donation and how it saves lives. The third one, which to me is equally important, is for new diabetics, for people today that have uh, diabetes, which is five times more common today than it was back when I got it in the early 70s, is that you can have a very normal life. I don't want to scare people into believing that, you know, you're in line to have a triple organ transplant is your only way out of diabetes. That's not the case. Today, you can live a totally normal life. There's um, products, technology that has helped uh, diabetics today, and there's foods geared for diabetics. The the world is a really different place. So I just, I want to make sure that people aren't scared off by 
oh my God, I've got diabetes. What's what what does my life look like? Sure. And fifty years ago, you know, there that was a true scare. You know, we're talking right. about years later, which I would say probably in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, the majority of that has really uh you know, excelled because as we know, everything in the internet space and information age is like things, they're being able to cure things, change things and right. uh, at a higher rate. So they'll probably have a cure within for, for a diabetic that of my age, if they were to get it today, there will probably be a cure within their life. Yeah. So. Which is amazing. So, yeah. I, but I think the biggest cure for everybody is to have resilience in anything yes. you're doing. And, uh, and I think that might be a, a greater cure uh, <laughs> for everything uh, in life versus, you know, just kind of staying stuck in the pain. Cause I think a lot of people stay stuck in this uh, pain uh, and they don't get out and they don't have hope and they don't prevail. Um, you know, and so I think this is a powerful thing that people can really lean on. Cheers to that. So, well, hey, I want to thank you for being on here uh, and sharing your story and just sharing this time with you. I, I think it's amazing what you've been able to do and endure uh, and just what you're doing with what you've been through is, is super powerful. Um, I'm going to leave any way to contact you in the show notes. And uh, again, if you're not an organ donor, uh, all it literally takes is somebody going on a website and doing that or going to the DMV and having it changed on your license. Uh, again, like Jim isn't here if somebody didn't choose that. Um, and so just realize there's 124,000 people in, in the state of California alone or in no, the US. No, that's, that's across the US, but California is the highest percentage is here in California over 10% in California alone. Wow. So, so just big number. think about how much you could impact somebody's life and realize that the person you're actually listening to on this podcast has been a recipient of three organs and probably would not be alive today without those. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being on today. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, if you guys are looking to connect further with a group of like-minded people, join myself and so many others in the Habit-Based Lifestyle Secrets group, where I will be dropping daily habits to help you live to your full potential. If you want to be one of our next case studies and begin living this habit-based lifestyle, feel free to reach out to me, jesse at habitbasedlifestyle.com. Until next episode, have a great day. 